Hi everyone, I'm Jason Padgett, Executive Director of the Nashville Film Festival. And currently I'm in the middle of producing the 55th annual Nashville Film Festival while building a world-class nonprofit arts advocacy organization. Really happy to be here. Jason Padgett, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I have to tell this audience right away, just to be transparent, that I do know you <laughs> and I do, I do work with you. Uh, I am uh, on the board of the Nashville Film Festival. And so I just, I, I want to be transparent with the audience about that. But all that means for you, if you're watching this or listening, is that we are going to have a good time. We are going to be loose and free and there. I w we will try our best not to have too many sort of inside baseball comments. But if there are some, uh, I will, I will do my best to address them out loud and, uh, and let you guys in on the fun as well. So before we get started, let me just read a short bio, uh, of, of, the aforementioned uh, Jason Padgett. And Jason, you just tell me, like, the internet is the internet, right? So you tell me if any of this is outdated, uh, completely incorrect, uh, whatever, and and we can go from there and uh, amend to it. But this is this okay. is a short bio. Uh, Jason is a dynamic. Should we stop right there? Is that is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> that part is 100% correct, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Jason is a dynamic, global, C-level leader with deep experience and success as both in-house and agency executive. He has expertise across key disciplines, including brand development, creative design, digital strategy, marketing communications, and strategic partnerships. Jason can effectively lead teams in successful strategic planning, consumer engagement and generating increased organizational value. And of course he is the current and since 2018, I believe executive director of the Nashville film festival, which is a Oscar qualifying film festival and globally recognized. Jason, how did that sound? That was perfect. That, that, that was great. What a great life I've led, huh? Uh, you have led a great life. You have one of the things I love about you is you have some of the best stories, uh, from just business and music and film around. And we will get into that. Um, I want to do something a little differently on this interview, because I know that a lot of filmmakers will watch this both locally, regionally, and globally, and they'll want to sort of get to the meat of what it is and what does it mean to be running a festival and accepting and rejecting films. So I just want to start there. We will bounce around a little bit. We do that anyway on this podcast, but um, I want to start sort of with the elephant in the room, which is what does an executive director do? Well, that, that, that could take an hour. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> try to keep it brief. Um, well, the, the funny thing, Chris, is I didn't know what an executive director of a film festival did until I actually had to start doing it. Um, I, I had an idea based on how it was described to me and I'd been to, dozens if not hundreds of film festivals but always as a as an audience member a sponsor a patron whatever it may be and and i when i took on the role i i felt almost guilty for the fact that i didn't ever think about how much work it really is to yeah. put these things together so it's it's so much fun to go and watch the movies and you know and, and have the the social time and and go to parties and all that but when you think about what goes into making all those things happen my job is just to make sure that the thing happens. I mean, really in the broadest sense, and that includes honestly everything. Um, and the programming part of it, which we can certainly talk about, is actually the thing that, that I, I'm, I'm most uh, distant from, meaning we have a, a wonderful programming team uh, led by Lauren Thielen, and, and it's you know another dozen people in and around her who spend the entire year you know soliciting films, pre-screening films, screening films, selecting films, all those things. And that part, that part is obviously a huge undertaking, which I have really nothing to do with other than setting up kind of our uh, brand standards and our, and our procedural standards. But and I can certainly talk about it a little bit. But for me, my responsibility is to make sure that everything in the organization works year round and that we pull off a world class festival and execution top to bottom is stellar. And that includes literally everything, um, you know, from from our final number at the end of the year in terms of attendance and revenue down to did we actually pick up all the trash at the venue that we just rented and, and 
you know, did we, did we fulfill that contract? Right. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's really everything. And, and, and so, so it, as an executive director, I, I take that responsible responsibility seriously. And, and, and to me, the important thing is that the filmmakers have a great experience and build their careers based off of our festival and that the audience members have a great experience and learn something more about themselves and about the films that they saw. So if those, if those things happen, then I've, I've done a good job. The audience here is global and sort of hyper local and regional at the same time. It's an interesting audience that we have here, a good mix. And so with that in mind, I don't want to assume that everyone listening or watching knows anything, even one iota about the National Film Festival. Can you just describe to people what is NAF and why it, it's an important festival uh, from a global POV? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question. The Nashville Film Festival, you know, from, from my point of view, it really is one of the most important independent film festivals in the U.S. It's certainly w one of the longest running. This is going to be our 55th annual festival, and, and that trail is only behind in longevity in the U.S., you know, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and, and, and just a couple others. So we're, we're right up there in terms of the, the length and, and longevity of a festival. So that's, that's one thing that we're very proud of. In terms of scale and scope of the festival itself, you know, we are an international festival in that we accept films from all over the world. In fact, we, we deliberately program a, a pretty healthy dose of international films. And, and part of our objective is to be a very diverse uh, festival in terms of the types of films and where they come from and the types of people that make them. So uh, from that level, we're, uh, we're very similar to something like a Sundance or, or a Toronto or any of those where, where the difference lies. And, and I don't compare ourselves in terms of scale to the Torontos and, and uh, Sundances of the world. They, those are different beasts in, in my, in my view, although similar, they're, they're, they're kind of cousins to us, but, but much larger and they have different objectives and, and obviously, um, great legacies uh but but we we we're in that tier of um us based f festivals and as you mentioned oscar qualifying which which is also very special and unique mm -hmm. um and and because of the region that we're in um you know one of our objectives is really to to build a platform for independent filmmakers that may not have the the resources that that people have in new york or la all the time so we open up categories that are particular to made in Tennessee or particular to student made films um, in, in a way to, to, to create a, a greater gateway for those folks, um, especially some of the, the, as I said, student and local filmmakers. But, but if I were to be really general about the, the programming in its final form, if you were to go to Sundance and see all the great films there, we're very similar in terms of the number of films, shorts, uh, features, documentaries, narratives, uh, animation, you know, just the, the, the offering is, is very similar in terms of the types of films that you would see. And of course, the other thing worth mentioning about festivals in general is, and this is something I love about film festivals, is that every festival programs based on a philosophy and a point of view about what they want to be. And Nashville, and the programming team does that, but not only do they do that, they do that differently year over year. So depending on um, sort of what what is interesting to the, the the head of programming every year about what may be happening around the world, what types of films may be emerging from other festivals, um, you know, those programming selections they they don't always just represent what's the best film. I mean, how do you say what's the best film? It's really right. Obviously, there's a quality marker for films, but what are the films that best represent um, our festival this year and the and the unique art arti artistic work of filmmakers from around the world? And that can right. vary from year to year. And it's something that I think filmmakers in particular, if they don't already know, it's worth remembering because um, the acceptance, there are so many great films every year that just don't get accepted. And it's not because they aren't great. It's just because they may not fit in a in a in a particular programming theme for that particular year, and that's one of the hardest things about the programmer's job in a festival is making those really hard decisions. Well, I want to dig in on that a little bit. So first, let me go back 
you talked about the number of film submissions. I can't remember if we talked about this or not. Did the number in 2023 drop from the traditional amount that typically gets programmed? And and what is that number? What how many films is the sort of the North Star for for NAF? Well, for 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 entries that we that we receive and review, it, it receive it, it, versus accept or right. screened, right? Right. We can okay. do both numbers so, if you want. Yeah. yeah, that that number actually, yeah, last year was 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 better than the year prior, and I think part of that was d- due to sort of the production uh, dip that 2020 brought and and some of the the liabilities there. But but we are we are now tracking, you know, at at essentially an, an all time high in in the range around seven thousand between wow sixty seven and seven thousand. Entries and that includes, of course, shorts, features, and and all of those categories I mentioned. And and of that, the programming number uh, for the Nashville Film Festival has also varied over the years. And again, it's it it it, it can change year to year for a whole host of reasons. But when I when I started, when I inherited, you know, the role that I have now, um, and as you may remember, the Nashville Film Festival was programming something like thir- three hundred and thirty five films is what is what was mm-hmm. on the slate, and they were running them uh in you know 10 theaters over 10 days yeah and so that was so so when i when i came into the role um i i read all i read all of the information about the the you know the decision to get there i talked to some of the previous board members and i went to the festival myself and experienced it and executed it of course i I wasn't responsible for that that structure that had been because it was you know already in place but you know i recognized first of all, that's, that's a lot of films. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And and I think that's the philosophy of let's get as many things in here as we can. Let's showcase as much great work as we can. And there's value to that for sure. And from an audience perspective, uh, if you're someone that has the capacity and the time and the interest, and you want to literally park yourself in what, you know, one of these uh, festivals for 10 days for, you know, 12 hours or more a day, you can, you can really consume a lot of films and that's yeah. a great benefit. Now, <laughs> what what I what I also recognize on the other side of that is we are a curated experience and part of that curation and that responsibility to those filmmakers that are selected is to help help market their films as as best we can. I mean, we're yeah. still talking about, you know, well over 100 films as we stand today. But, you know, if you're in the festival, we want to be a marketing partner. We want to be we want to be someone that can can raise your work not just to the public but to the media and to social media and and to help help build that now when you get to the 330 mark that gets that gets substantially harder to do and yeah. so what what i felt was a there weren't enough people to to fill that many screenings for that many days and and that's something else you want to make sure you're getting strong audiences uh, for for each screening and number two you know, as a marketer, the ability to tell the story of 335 films when you really only have about a 30 day window to market those films based right. on the selection date to the first day of the festival. I felt that that was a disservice. So what we ended up doing was looking at, again, all of the pros and cons and practical aspects of it. And in, in my second year, reduced the, the number of days of the festival to seven and reduced the number of films down to I think it was like 220, so we cut it substantially, and then and then since then we've we've changed the formula to the point that we're now, I think, aiming to be somewhere in the 170 uh, range for what will be 2024. So and that that will be determined based on the final screening, but that's a target. Could be more, it could be less. Yeah, I, the thing that I like about it, and I, n- I already know what filmmakers won't like about that number, but the thing I like about that number is there is an exclusivity to getting into this festival. Um, it's funny. You mentioned 7,000 submitted films all over the world. I know the world is a big place. Um, but the thing we hear over and over and over again, and I've heard my entire time in the film industry is how hard it is to get a movie funded. But you know, there's like somehow 10,000, 20,000 films get made every year. It reminds me of like my time, uh, before film when I was in corporate America, and I would travel all over the country to uh, these conferences and workshops, and these things would be sponsored, uh, and and uh, you would have booths that were enormous, 
uh, from, you know, multi-billion dollar cap companies. And I thought to myself, at some point, you know, inside of every one of these companies and sponsors would be the solution to the problem, right? And I'm like, at some point, you do have to solve that problem, mm -hmm. right? Or you are the market. The market is that you are driving this thing because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. At some point, if you're pouring billions of dollars into a problem and you're not fixing it, uh, it's just it's just uh, it's just public relations uh, to to a degree. And, and you're feeding some other market that we're sort of not aware of. And I think about that in film a lot. Like, I think funding is really hard. It's the hardest thing that filmmakers do. But at some point, but we also have to address the fact that these films are getting made. There are people out there actually giving money to make these things happen, whether they be your dad, mom, or some financier. That's just a sidebar. Um, I noticed you didn't mention music, and I know that you would want to. So music is in the sort of um programming around music and uh music based films i think would be uh a niche here mm. is that fair mm. to say like that's kind of the thing that naf does that no other festival does quite the same yeah yeah i th i think that's true and and of course i mean what i outlined was really kind of the the structure of our of our festival i think when you get down into the what we stand for what we believe in and and what we do try to focus on you know our our kind of three word uh, brand tagline is film music culture and mm -hmm. when i think about what we stand for and what we want to represent specifically within our festival window it's it's film it's music and it's culture and and those things can come in all kinds of different forms but to me music and film are, are really inextricably linked and they always have been there are very yes. few exceptions to that i would say like a quiet place Without, I don't know that there's like that was one movie I, there wasn't I don't think any music in but but yeah. beyond that there it's music is a great driver of, of film and storytelling and of course you know I came from the, the music industry is kind of it was my origin story and had a great love for it and actually where I got introduced to Sundance in the first place was being in the music industry and being a, sp a sponsor partner for for uh, music artists and music brands in the Sundance environment, and I so my first Sundance I got there and I said, wow, this is such a great uh, tie-in together. And you had guys like Neil Young, who was wow. uh, you know in in the Sundance Lodge because he was promoting a film he had made, and and you know that list goes on forever. But the point is um, that they are so closely tied, and here we are in Music City in Nashville, and in a city that's known primarily for you know country music but the it's much bigger than that and we have the the major parent labels all have uh, offices here and publishers here and it's it's way bigger than just country and and um we also do a lot of score composing here there's a lot of score composing for both film television and and video games that happens here and that's continuing to grow so we are a film and music town um in that respect and and it's something again i'm very passionate about and then music documentaries are things that it's it's kind of where i got really interested in documentaries to begin with and going back to just being a kid and and typically where i was getting those was on pbs so i remember very specifically um you know one on, on um, bob marley and one on elvis presley and you know folks that i'd heard of and knew a little bit about but then all of a sudden you see these wonderfully made films and uh, it just changes your whole perspective of them and their music. And, and I think that happens to everybody. And so I love music documentaries, no matter who they're about, even if I, even if I don't like their music because yeah. their stories are so rich and interesting. So we have a very yeah. dedicated uh, music documentary category, which is, which is fairly unique. Um, we also have a music video category, which is very unique. Uh, and those are, are designed for a music video that, is in its in its in its own form uh storytelling about the song in in sort of the cinematic way and so that was a category that we just introduced last year and then on top of that we we've for historically since i've been here opened with a, a, a high profile music documentary so mm -hmm. i'll try to list them in uh maybe not in order but we open with chuck mm -hmm. berry we open with um uh, johnny cash we open with the Bee Gees. You know, so it's 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 been it's been every year a new story about a new artist, and of course, all different genres. Um, so so we're very proud of that, and and and, yeah. and and it's part of our it's part of our DNA. I really 
think these music docs are fantastic. And one of the cool things about doing these documentaries on opening night where you have an opening night party right after it and being in Nashville is that many times these artists show up. Uh, the Tanya Tucker documentary was fantastic mm -hmm. and she showed up and was was so gregarious and entertaining and and uh, uh she was the person we saw in the film which i thought was great uh, gloria Gaynor is another example yep. from last year that was just an amazing one um and i've always loved them i mean i i know there's been these music docs even when COVID was going on i remember watching the Bee Gees doc mm -hmm. online and i was like that was amazing and i don't and to your point like i'm not the biggest Bee Gees fan. I didn't, you know, I didn't get any of Barry Gibbs solo albums, but the, <laughs> the, the, if they exist, but that documentary I did love that documentary okay. was, was, was incredible. I think we've had, um, Aerosmith here in the past, Steven Tyler here in the past. We've had some, um, our, our, our NAF has had some really big ones. I'm going to try my best to refrain from saying we in this interview. It's going to be very, very hard. But yes, NAF has had. Well, some you 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 ones. are you are part of we. You've been a, a, a before you were on the board. You were a, a, a long time uh, uh, audience member, supporter, advocate, and that's really that's what the 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 culture part of the mm -hmm. film music culture is that you are, you are we and everyone who comes to the festival is part of us it's not me you know Jason, i'm that, trying to be a good interviewer here the, the national <laughs> film festival, this is an important this is an important message yes. the national film festival is we and if you've come okay. to the festival you are part of us and that applies not just to you but to really everybody and i want to encourage love people it. to come, come and be a part of it yeah I, I agree with that that sentiment completely and you know even you know up to i guess i attended my first one in 14 or 15. Uh, I had a short film, I think there in 15 didn't win anything. I think it got sixth place in some short contest. And then, then we had our run of features that were there that all won Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee feature award. So, uh, I think, I think adult interference, which at the time was called wild man still has the all time record for audience score in that category. Nice. Uh, I want to say that you'll have to double check. You have to go to the to the annals <laughs> and and see if that still remains uh, to true the, to the or not. But yeah, <laughs> you, it's it's been great. It's it's been a natural progression for me. And um, I don't know if it's conflict of interest, but I'd still like to submit films maybe that I was involved in because I'm I'm a film producer. I still make movies uh, all the time or as much as I can uh, into the festival, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's always been great. You mentioned POV, this annual POV. Now I haven't heard you say that before. I think that's really cool. It's a cool idea because it doesn't say, Hey, I'm the programmer in this case, Lauren Thielen, the, the awesome and wonderful Lauren Thielen. She's not saying, Hey, this is my taste. And, uh, I'm going to be sort of dictatorial in terms of what I think is good taste and what I think isn't. She's and what you're saying is she's following the trend of industry and, and what should be programmed to make the very best festival. And I think that there are filmmakers that would say, okay, this is a, a music town film festival. And so I guess the question would be to you, how do you manage um, the expectation from the music industry uh, in town that they have from the festival? How do you keep them from putting their thumb on the scale to a degree that's uncomfortable for filmmakers? How do you work together with, with industry to maybe prevent that from happening? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I think just to go back to the, the POV, I mean, there, there, it's a combination of things. I mean, it's not just looking at trends. It, that's certainly part of it, but, but, and there is, there is, there are some sort of, you know, uh, I'm sure there are absolutely tastes and, and, mm -hmm. and kind of, um, and that, that applies again, person to person through the programming team all the way up to and through Lauren. And, and that becomes, a com those are regular conversations and it's, it's, it's very academic in that regard, meaning, um, it's not just, oh, that was a good movie or a bad movie. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into these decisions. So that's just, that's just part of the, the, the behind the curtain, I guess, uh, how it works. But, but then again, it's, it's, you know, we, we fall 
our festival ends up in the fall. And so we have the benefit of seeing what comes right out of the gate at um, Sundance and then South by and Tribeca and, you know, others. So, so we can kind of get a sense of what other audiences are responding to, what other themes are, are resonating. And then of course, culturally, you know, what topics are emerging and a topic that um, may be totally dormant to, to popular culture in November uh, might be highly relevant in March during our kind of screening time. You just never know. And so those, mm -hmm. th that's why it's a dynamic. That's why, that's why it's always changing and, and why that part of it is, is so challenging and, and rewarding at the same time. And as far as, you know, influence, I mean, that, that is a difficult part of running a film festival. And, and the only way to deal with it is really just to be totally, uh, objective and principled in how you how you run a f your festival and what that means is there's a structure there's a process and then there's integrity behind that process so um, we're allowed to be friends with a lot of people for a lot of reasons but we we don't accept and reject based on on that and and mm -hmm. that causes a lot of uh, headaches for people uh, both on our side and on, on the other side, depending on what it is. But we just try to be, you know, really clear about, you know, who we are and what we're doing. And if it, if it fits, uh, the, the programming structure of that year and it's of, of high quality that it, it, there's a spot for it, it's, it's going to be in. And then there's also things that end up in consideration where we try to find a spot for them. If we're at that very last couple of slots, we may have, you know, two more screening spots. There ends up being, you know, dozens of films that are in that for consideration in that very, very last moment of decision. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them end up ha having to fall out, but that's not, that's not based on anything other than does it make sense for the programming philosophy this year? Does it make sense for our audience this year? And is it the best, is it the best choice that could fill out that 168 or 172 films or whatever that number may be. Um, and so, you know, I would say probably among uh, filmmakers or whatever it may be, we, we've probably lost some friends over the years who, who didn't like that philosophy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's uh, disappointing, but that's okay because I'd rather have a structure of uh, integrity than, than to be burdened by a, a bunch of holes in the fence that, that ultimately that d destroys the value in my view of, 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 a, of a real festival. So I, so it's not a problem for me. I don't like it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really cause me much concern other than just trying to maintain good relationships. Well, I, to me, that's a great answer. And um, it, it's the reason you're, you're the right guy for the job. You talk about sort of sea level uh, dynamicism, you know, there it is, right. The ability to hold two thoughts in your head and still make those objective um, uh, decisions uh, integrity decisions. And just to clarify that for this audience is, I think that's you know, really wonderful. You were quoted in In Focus magazine as saying, any great film is equal parts art and science. The skill sets required are both creative and technical, and you can't underserve either one. Um, with respect to that quote, what are some of the objective factors that go into festival acceptance at NAF or rejection? And then what are some of the films that you love that you think nailed it both in the art and the, and the science of it? Well, again, as, as someone who's n not a professional programmer, I, I, I won't talk so much about like, you know, what was a great film versus not a great film, because I, I like I also like to be objective about that uh, as well, no matter what my tastes are. But what I will say is on the art and science of it all, um, certainly, you know, the, the, the and this I don't think will surprise anyone, but it's really about the the, the audience experience. So. On the art of it, it could really be a, a film can can qualify and really be about anything. And I think every good programmer is not looking at it just, oh, does this resonate to me? Is this about a topic that I care about? Is this interesting? Right. Like that's not how they look at those films. So so the art of it is 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 about really a unique voice, a unique perspective, a unique story, a, a unique well of, way of telling a story. I mean, there's just a million ways that that can be done. And that's, again, the beauty of film is there's not a formula. And and actually, if you followed a formula, it would probably be a pretty boring film uh, yeah. from a, from an execution standpoint. Um, well, if on, you did, well, if you followed it in a explicit way. Yeah, yeah, yeah super absolutely. Go ahead. Um, and on the, on the, um, 
on the science part of it, you know, th those parts are easy to sit here and say, and they're much harder to execute. But it's really, again, the combination of of the the million choices that a that a, a director and and producers have to make, which are uh, the quality of the sound, the the quality of the lighting, the quality of the acting, the quality of the score. Those are four things that if 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 all if any one of those four are of poor quality objectively then they're going to stand you're going to as an audience member you're going to know that in the first 5 seconds and immediate and, and Chris I'm sure you know this feeling you've sat in a film the lights have come up and all of a sudden you recognize something's not quite right whatever it may be <laughs> right yeah. it's yeah, the, yeah. the sound the light the the whatever it is and, and even the score can throw you off immediately like hmm this, this doesn't feel right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm talking about just the quality of it. I'm not talking about like the artistry of it necessarily. And so now that's not to say that you can't get over maybe a, a bad cast. I mean, meaning a, a one, one person who's maybe not as high quality actor as others. Um, you know, maybe you can get past that or maybe the audio isn't perfect, but everything else is so far superior that you can live with that. You know, those things can, can get through. So you're not going to be disqualified for any one of those things necessarily, but I think that they immediately put you at the back of the line and you got to work really hard to get in the front of the line. Now, when we're talking about things like score, sound, um, you know, acting, all those, that's back to, it's the, it's the series of choices. It's the series of decisions. It's the, it's the, the director's choices, but it's also some of that comes at uh, both time and expense. So, I mean, you can get really great audio if you have really great audio people and you spend lots of time. So it, it's not just about the production value as much as it is uh, making sure that you're spending um you're you're spending time making those decisions, planning those in advance so that you know that you're not letting down, you're not compromising to the point that you're going to let down your audience in the first five seconds of your or, film. Or, or the story. And that's, so you get all that right. You get all the technical stuff you just mentioned correct. And then you have the big giant problem of, did I even write a good story? Right. But, but that's <laughs> Because you're not going to know until you've watched the whole thing whether yeah. you got this. Like as a as an audience member, anyway, you may not get it until it's over, and you still may not get it when it's over. But I'm saying, <laughs> of all those other things, um, you're at least not going to be you, you're not going to be kind of um, you know in, in a in working from a deficit on a confusing story uh, until it's over. Right? We have a belief, and I've heard a few people mirror this belief. And let me know what you think. I. I even uh, I think Brian Owens, former creative director of NAF and now uh, runs uh, SIF up in up in uh, Ontario, I think. Um, producer Papa Bear, producer Joe, keep me straight on that. Let me make sure I got the right province in Canada uh, correct. Oh, but, Calgary, but, yeah. yeah, Calgary. Sorry, yeah, Calgary. What am I talking about? Yeah, Calgary. You're a hockey guy, so you're going to know that right away. It's <laughs> kind of unfair advantage. Uh, anyway, um, but I should know that. Uh, but we have this belief that you can tell if a movie's going to be good or not just on the font choice on the titling and credits when it opens. And even if that isn't true, and I know there's, of course, there are obvious exceptions, you do get an immediate sense of the filmmaker's taste, like what oh, they think is makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think maybe the exception to that is is when it is a choice and it's by design so like um and and these are shocking when they work really well but i'm thinking about something like stranger things when it was intended to be very specifically in that era of the 80s 80s yeah and as someone who lived through that era myself to 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 see that and not be able to poke a hole in any of it in terms of the authenticity of it was pretty crazy because you see, I thought that was a great taste choice. I thought that was really, well, no, that's, what I'm saying. that's what I'm yeah, saying yeah. is yeah. that was really, really well done. And, and yet it was done in a way to, to by by design, look outdated. And, and then there was another, I think it was a, maybe an American horror story season. I think it was where they, they did like the camp, you know, um, Friday the 13th camp uh, retro thing, which worked very well. But I just, I remember like if you put those types of uh, opening credits 
on a film that you're making as modern day, it's it's gonna be it's gonna yeah. be weird. Yeah. It's gonna be weird. Yeah, but, but yeah, and, and it is it is so funny because um, when you think about something as simple as the a font choice on a on a on a credit that those things do matter and and they matter a lot and who can explain why i can't explain why i mean it, but you can look at it and and know if it's right or wrong but you it's hard to say why you know yeah there's a there's a documentary out there called helvetica that everybody should watch and it, it's literally about the font uh helvetica and yeah. it's so funny we're bringing this up because in the prep before this conversation, I was talking with the producers about how producer Papa Bear used to draw fonts by hand and would have like font packs. Like mm. you'd have Times New Roman and Helvetica. This is before you had a printer. This is when you had an art table and a T square and you had to draw everything out. And it's understood that that font is just like the perfect font. Like there's nothing better than a good crisp Helvetica, and we don't know why. Now, also shout out to a uh, friend of the podcast, friend of mine, collaborator of mine, Maki Dapp, who always reminds everyone in his sets that and, and in post credits are part of the movie. So you'll never see a movie that that he directed that doesn't continue throughout the credits. And all the best movies do that. Like Poor mm -hmm. Things this year, for example, uh, even though I did think some of those font choices were extremely too small, like you can't read them. The the credit roll was incredible. Like you you did not want to turn it off when the credits mm -hmm. ran at all. You wanted to watch to the very end. They had some really unusual things in there, um, uh, as as sort of artistic choice in the credits. I really believe in that. If you blow somebody away in the opening and closing credits, you've done a you've done an art piece. And there are so many filmmakers that just say, okay, it's done. Uh, make make me a CSV file of. Uh, who should be credited and let's upload it to this thing. And well, it's yeah, like, and no, 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 no. Uh, do that. Like the, 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 some of the, in the, in the James Bond series or the, you know, some, maybe some of the early kind of Hitchcock style films, but those, those opening credits are films of them in and of themselves. Right. Sometimes yeah. they're kind of art yes. design packages. So they're, their own things. They are super important. And I think the beginning more than the end, but I think they, they, they both really matter. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is every single decision that a director has to make is really important. And, you know, having kind of been in, in the producing role, it's, you only have so much time and so much money and, and making every decision exactly right is really, really hard. It's really hard to do. Yes. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's so hard to make a really great movie. You know? Yeah. Yeah. When you do it, you should, you know, take that time to congratulate yourself. And I know there's been a quote you've had in the past where you're like the best part of being an executive director is sitting down with a, with a film director when their movie screens for the first time with an audience, that moment of just fevered anticipation and anxiety where you've really labored over a thing for a year. And now here comes the moment of, is this a bust or not? And yeah. there's just nothing like that. It's almost like watching a guy lose $30,000 at the roulette table and then double down on the bet. It's like, <laughs> okay, here we go. Like your life is on the line. Like it's, it's, it's great. Um, it's impossible to talk about film in 2024 without talking about AI. And it sort of occurred to me that we can sort of fight against it. We saw a new law come through. I think Tennessee is the first state to have uh, this thing called the Elvis law that sort of protects musicians from AI. I think that's important because I think AI has figured out how to reproduce someone's voice now to, uh, to and, and it'll just get better. Uh, so those protections are important. Um, and I love that law and I love that, that it happened. Don't know if that can happen in film or if we'll be the first to do it here, or if we should just link hands with the technology and then create a new category going forward, maybe 2025 and beyond, and just call it best AI film. What do you think about that? A new category for submissions for filmmakers that are more prompt makers than they are filmmakers. Uh, you know, I think, well, first of all, I think the topic is really important and I think it's going to be a topic for the considerable future. Um, uh, so there, I think there's a long way to go there. I'm, I'm not ready to start calling for 
AI categories yet, because I really <laughs> think like a lot of things, I think there's going to be, I, I think there should and, and will be uh, a happy medium, which, which results in the very best uh, product. I mean, if you talk about AI in its broadest sense, um, and if you were to look back in, in, in terms of like the music industry is a, is a drum machine AI, hmm. uh, you know, and, and, yeah. And then you could apply that to almost every aspect of modern day music production. And, and certainly that's a different topic than, than what we're talking about with film. But I think the principle is similar. And then, you know, look at, um, you know, James Cameron avatar is, is like, is that AI, you know, and, and, and where, where do you draw the line between animation, visual effects, know? animation, visual, and AI? I mean, yeah. there's, just a, there's a lot there. And I, so I think it's more than all or nothing. What I do think, um, where I think the balance um, may may play out is, you know, there are there and, and you've seen these in kind of early examples of AI. There are things that are impossible, both literally or practically to shoot as an as an independent filmmaker or even as as a as a studio filmmaker. There are things that are both literally and practically impossible to shoot that that AI can assist with and can generate. And, and that happens today as we speak special effects, mm -hmm. as we we're talking about. But I think as an independent filmmaker, there, there might be ways to leverage those things to kind of polish up uh, an idea that, that maybe would not be ex executable under the current independent you know, filmmaking structure of financing and, and, and whatever it may be. So like everything, I think it's about how the quality of those choices are used and, and applied. And ultimately, the only judge of that is going to be did the film really resonate with audiences or didn't and whether it was ai or not ai now i agree with you on the on the copyright things in particular voices and actors i mean that's that's a different thing what, what i'm talking about is really just more supplemental you right. know uh, right. backgrounds and things that that would cost uh, prohibitively too much money um and, and yet serve the need of advancing a story and, and again right. It's so much, there's so much within there. I do, I feel very strongly about protecting kind of the individual and the, the artistry of the individual, certainly voices, actors, all those things. But when it comes to like, you know, is a matte painting AI from going back to the, the old days? Like, I mean, is that, is that, you know, you could debate it all day long. I think the balance will shake itself out, but I think the advocates for the, for the filmmakers and the actors need to really be really strong in in the immediate future because that's the only time they're going to have the ability to defend that i mean once it's once it's gone it's gone well i really like your analogy to music uh, i started in music just like you and um for those who don't know jason straight out of college went to go intern at a at an independent label in in new york the mean streets hitting the streets uh, <laughs> with, the, right. with the, yeah, with the, <laughs> with the PR and gorilla, gorilla marketing teams there. Yeah. But I also started in music and I, I just remember there was so much pushback from instrumentalists and, and music purists about sampling and hip hop, for example, and how that was going to destroy music and, and that, you know, maybe it'll never catch on and that everything's derivative. And I think while there is some truth to that, that just hasn't played out. I think we underestimate our own ability to discern quality and beauty. So to this day, people know that if they're hearing a Kanye West track. They know he there's a sample in it. They know that that that's we expect there to be a sample in that. And we know there's a difference between hearing that and then going and watching a live concert full of instrumentalists and and um, seasoned and masterful musicians. And we want that sound. When we want that sound, we go to it, right? We find it and we patronize it. And when we want samples or things that are more digitized and to your question, is that AI or not? Like a, there's a time where we want that sound. And I think we'll always be able to see the difference between guerrilla style, independent filmmaking and what an AI produced, you know, for the most part, um, this is a, we're recording this on the 26th of March. And just recently there's a, a movie that came out a horror film called, um, I think it's called late night with the devil. And uh, it's doing pretty well uh, in the box office so far, but it got a lot of flack at South by Southwest because it had three scenes in it for, uh, that were AI produced. And 
somehow this got this got found out and and these filmmakers had to defend it so part of me was like why do they have to defend that and i just have to remind myself that we're at, sort of at the beginning of this thing you know there there probably were times where filmmakers had to defend the use of visual effects and using you know cgi in a film and then the matrix came along and we were like if you can do it like that every time then we're good with it you know mm-hmm. Um, so maybe that will happen in, in AI as well. You know, I, yeah, I, mean, I just think we're smarter than, than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. No, I mean, it goes back to the quality of, of the experience for the audience is going to be the ultimate, uh, measuring stick. And then that goes alongside that of, of protecting kind of the individual rights of, of, of people, you know, the, the creators that, um, you know, if you're borrowing from something else that's different than just generating, you know, something unique from AI. So I think it's it's a really difficult topic. But but like your example with South by Southwest, I think those scenarios will continue to play themselves out over over time. And there'll be a lot of healthy debate about it. And ultimately, I think the quality of the end product will drive the answer. And, 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 and that, that, that's based, you know, just, just to have uh, the access to AI doesn't mean you're going to end up automatically having a great product from it. You know, that, yeah. that, that, that comes down to a lot of different factors as you know. Right. Especially when you're trying to edit AI or you're trying to sort of, um, you know, color grade and make all the AI stuff match the stuff you did on a real camera. You know, there is uh, some technical expertise and skill that goes into that from an editing standpoint. You have to be aware of that. The one thing I will push back even on myself here about the comparison between the shifts in music and film is that the money um, generation part of being a touring musician is live shows. So no matter what you create digitally, uh, with samples, beat machines, as you said, drum machines, or even AI voices and instrumentation, at some point, a human being has to get on stage and perform those things. That's why when a track is overproduced, it's really, really bad because you can't pull the you know humans together, a band together to play those things at the concert. You really literally have to play it back in the day. It was a dat track, but you literally have to just play a track and have the musician sing to the track. And there's all kinds of terrible things that can happen there. Uh, see um, Ashley Simpson on SNL, for example. So so you kind of want a live band experience where you are uh, creating sounds and instrumentation that can be duplicated by a person on stage, at least some of it. And that's where music has a major, major protection in, in my mind, because you just cannot make a living on streams now. The streams pay 0.003 cents a stream you need a million streams to get three thousand dollars i mean that is shameful and so it's not the 80s anymore where if you wrote a hit you you were probably well off i was mentored by wayne perry who had hits on backstreet boys albums laurie morgan uh, brooks and dunn and he had a he had several homes and mansions based on writing those songs and just being a songwriter only. He wasn't even producing the track. Mm-hmm. Those days are gone, Jason. Like it's <laughs> like been over. Like you can have multiple hits. And if you're just relying on streams alone, you're in big trouble. Like you almost have to have music sync licensing thrown on top of it in order to make a living. And so if you're a musician, you AI is not really a threat because at the end of the day, you have to go on stage for stage for stage. And film is not like that. You make the movie and the actual exhibition of the film is where you make your money, right? That mm-hmm. That's why the price of a movie at a theater can never go down to the cost of what a stream is because then the industry is just over. There is no second window there that makes sense. Well, and that's why I think both in music and in film, and I think I think you're right about that. I, I think you know AI. You know, if I'm looking at it just through a a, a worldview of if 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 things were the way I would want them to be, which is often how I look at things, <laughs> is you know AI the world according simply, to Jason, 
Right. It, it, AI would be a very valuable tool in a toolbox for for creators, whether they be film or music. And you can you iron out some little issues you may have here and there and use AI, save a little time, save a little money. That would be that would be the way to to, to do it. Now, if in, in an example of um, songs, you know, music, it's like I, ha I have a friend who was fascinated with the AI generators when they all became kind of publicly available and just thought it was amazing that it could write a song if you put in some prompts and it would write a song. And I'm not going to name the artist, but he sent me a song that was derivative of a very specific artist that, that I happen to be a fan of. And he thought it was just so amazing that it could do this. And I listened to it and, uh, and even if I didn't know it was AI generated, it, was, it had no heart, no soul, didn't just didn't, it didn't resonate. It would never be a hit. It just, I mean, it's, it's just not that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, could it be a music bed for a commercial someday in the future? I, I don't know. But my point is there, there's a heart to artistry in, in film and music that I, it can never be replaced by AI. And I think that people's perception of art in film and music is so uh, inherent to their, to, to, to being a human being that I just don't think that um, we'll ever get to the point where it can it can replace it can replace us. I, yeah. I hope. And, and, and even if it does, we'll seek out the human. Yeah, I, I think like I agree with you that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and the more sort of edgy your genre is, the more political and and important in the zeitgeist your genre is of music, the more you're protected. Like mm -hmm. hip hop, I there was a guy who did something with I guess Eminem, like right right a couple of verses to this thing in the style of Eminem. Well, that one kind of worked out because it was a short little, it was like a vignette. It's like a snippet, like two mm -hmm. lines. And it sounded like his voice and people were blown away. Of course they were, you know, just going, the heads exploding. And cause I'm with you on most of this stuff, even the Sora stuff. I was like, that's not good enough for a feature film. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know the tech bros need to talk their book right? And, and bring people in and get them excited. But like this, I don't think they know what filmmakers do. I literally was like, I don't think they know what filmmaking is. If they, if they're excited about this, it'll get there. But with the prompts on music, I said, okay, so I tested it because of Eminem thing. I was like, write me two verses in the style of uh, Pusher T, which is uh, a gangster rapper right or, or i don't even know if that's even a, a good term anymore i don't know if it's the term that's used he's a hip-hop artist and but he's he's famous and and one of the best and the the verses i got back were so trash jason mm -hmm. and i Those realized i realized that oh this ai was trained to not say the words that person would say that would be considered explicit words but are um, but are essential to getting his fill and vibe and heart, as you said. Uh, if you were to try and do the same thing for like, a t like let's say the band Tool or Metallica or the Pumpkins or whatever, it would have a hard time. I don't think an AI, for example, would be able to produce the words, uh, God is empty just like me which is from a Smashing Pumpkins song uh, I think <laughs> called Zero. It won't produce it. It's not trained to say stuff like that. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Not yet, but it won't be. Like we saw Gemini come out. It's got black George Washington because it's just not like not even allowed to create a white person because <laughs> white people are evil, Jason. Don't you know this? So we, <laughs> so we can't even create a white person. In, in the AI. And there's just these AIs are not designed to do the things that artists do, which is reflect society and reflect what's happening now, which is sometimes explicit, uncomfortable and designed to piss you off or to inspire you or to energize you. And AI doesn't do that. To your point, it is just flat information, man. And mm -hmm. it's like, OK, great. So anyway, we beat that horse, but we it'll 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 continue to be a, a thing. Um, I mentioned your background as a, as an intern uh, in, in New York and music getting a start there, but you also, uh, and we mentioned this in the bio, but, but it, it bears repeating, like you, you're a master at uh, public relations, communications, marketing. You spent a ton of time at the C-suite level uh, and, and uh, VP level of, of Gibson and, and Fender and, 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 uh, 
I think Rowan and Cowan, I think is or Rogers and Cowan, excuse me. Um, and I guess that led me, and you mentioned this earlier too, about having to market each film. I didn't even know that that was a priority. That was like a learning thing for me. Like, Oh, we, we need to market the films that got entry into the festival. And how do you do that? If it's 300 films, I love that. That is you're speaking my language. I, I feel so badly when filmmakers get distributed by film companies that have 2000 movies to manage. How do you even do that? So to that point, how is in your mind, branding and marketing and communicating a film festival different than your world in those previous stops? Um, well, I think uh, that's another good question. I think that the, the, the principles are really the same I've found. And what's interesting is in the very, in the first call it 10 years of my career, which started at an assistant level in at Rogers and Cowan and, and grew up through, uh, up to a, a, a VP over that time period. But um, I was responsible for a client base that included corporations, that included individual artists themselves. I've, I've said this many times before, but at one time I represented both Motley Crue and Olivia Newton-John at the same time. All right. So, I mean, very diverse artists and had very different <laughs> objectives. And I, I, I constantly yeah. get them to go on tour together. Like I thought that would be a great double bill. <laughs> that never happened. But but, but, you know, and I worked with Randy Travis and Clint Black and Third Eye Blind and, mm -hmm. you know, Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, you just name it. But, and what I learned from that as being someone who represented both companies, I represented the award, award shows like uh, the Grammy Awards for many years. And then these individuals, it's really about building a brand that, that, that has, uh, has its own identity and its own audience and its own integrity of that brand. So what that means is, whatever the strengths of that person, that brand, that event, that company, that product are, you need to identify them, you need to champion them, you need to market and communicate them. And the discipline to be able to do that at such high quality over years and years and decades and decades as some of those artists did. And of course, all, all those artists had their ups and downs and, and all brands have ups and downs. All companies have ups and downs. The Grammys have had ups and downs. I mean, yeah. even very recently. So none of that is a given. You can't just um, think that you're good and you're going to forever be good. In fact, it's the exact opposite. You will never just stay at the top. It's just yeah. always a fight to stay near the top is really what it comes down to. And so what I learned really early on is, you know, even at that highest level, those artists that I mentioned uh, and those brands and th they're not impressed by themselves. They're only impressed uh, upon what they can do next and, and how, how much higher they can go. And I feel the same way about, about where we are now as a, as a festival. I love the legacy of the festival. I love the DNA of the festival. I love the history of the festival, but it's not, it's still not where I want it to be. And I want it to be uh, more, uh, accessible to more people, both filmmakers, audience members, and, and beyond just Nashville, really a national draw, which, which we are to some degree, but, but I'd like to be, I'd like to be more. And, and that doesn't mean I want to grow up to be Sundance. That's, that's something I, I often have to remind people. We're not trying to be something else. We're trying to be the strongest, most, um, most useful, uh, film festival that we can be. And that means to the community and that means to the filmmakers and that yeah. means to the audience members. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's so much, it's so reductive to say, well, you know, aren't you, don't you want to be the next Sundance? You know, that's kind of what I, I hear a lot. Like, don't you guys want to be the next can so that, so that you're super relevant and like, well, maybe in a relevant standpoint, but we'd like to be the best, NAF we can be. We'd like to be the first NAF. Like like so that because we we recognize and I think that you recognize as well and and everyone else on the on, on the team and on the board recognizes that the reason can became can was because it was a itself mm -hmm. first. It wasn't trying to be some other festival that existed somewhere else. Well and it's um, on the French Riviera, which helps a little bit. It helps but... quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it helps but I, I'm I'm going there. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm going there in early, late June, early July, uh, Jason. So I'll, I'll that's report great. back. The, I'll, I'll report back my findings well, to you. you. I will, I will be, I will, I will sneak 
things. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. I will not sneak any information. I will not be uh, uh, clandestine in any way. I will not be covert uh, at Can. Uh, but but it should be a great time. Okay. Do you want to do some rapid fire questions, Jason? No, sure. Absolutely. All right. Let's I'm not saying answer them all, but I'll try. Okay. We're going to shotgun some questions. Okay. What book or books do you recommend for someone who wants to follow your path? If any, the answer can be, there are no books to help you be executive. No, director yeah, Buster, well, that's, but, it's a great question. And you know what? There are no shortage of business books, marketing books, self-improvement. I mean, there's a million of them. And so that's actually, I'll answer the question, but those aren't the ones I'm thinking of what I'm thinking of that I particularly just love. And if you're a filmmaker or an aspiring filmmaker, I would recommend to try, try this uh, mm -hmm. if you haven't already. And I find it really interesting. So, you know, reading books, uh, what I, I like to do is read old kind of film noir books that, that turned into movies later. So the postman always rings twice or mm -hmm. uh, murder my sweet, which turned into farewell, my lovely as a, as a 1940s film. And, and so in, in some cases, you know, the books were, more colorful in their in their violence and drama than the movies because of the film code at the time but what i find interesting is and you can do it in either order read the book and watch the movie or watch the movie and read the book i just find it really interesting from a storytelling perspective some of these um how how you know screenwriters and filmmakers adapted this to that and sometimes mm -hmm. they do it totally differently sometimes they try to stay very close to the structure but if you're someone who is in the film industry and, and you know, want to get better at what you do, it's a great way to reverse engineer what a lot of those great filmmakers of the past did. And I particularly just love that era of film. So I trend towards those books and movies when I'm when I'm doing this exercise. But I think that can apply to to really anything. I mean, Bridges of Madison County or you know, whatever your tastes are, you know, f figure that out. But that that idea of what were the choices that were made, even down to the dialogue. I mean, dialogue in film is very different than dialogue in um, in books. And to, to understand if you want to be a screenwriter, how those things translate and what makes them successful. I know you said rapid fire. Sorry, this is a long answer, but, but <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it. It's all good. That's a great <laughs> answer. That's like maybe the best answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, in recent in recent memory, for sure. Um, another thing for filmmakers, though, how do we avoid what should a filmmaker avoid or what should they look for to avoid the scam film festivals that exist on Film Freeway? Mm. Oh, that's a great question, too. I mean, I, I, it really to, to me. And, and it, that really bothers me that those things even exist, that those that those people even exist, uh, the, the, the people that are taking advantage. But, you know, that's the, the way the world is, I suppose. But um, I would say that the way to avoid it is to do your homework. And, you know, part of that begins with obviously the film freeway, um, uh, you know, synopsis itself. But it, it goes beyond that. I mean, really look at look at the the legacy of the uh, the longevity of the festival itself look on social media for films or filmmakers that had been a part of it in the past there's a great way to sort of capture like what their experiences were but i would say given kind of the landscape of important film festivals it's pretty easy in my view to identify say the top 50 and and you know when you're talking about kind of uh barriers of entries there there's really not a lot of reason to to go below that you know 50 or top 100 whatever the number is there's a there's a certain cutoff where there's absolute legitimacy and then you get into a gray area and if you're if you're treading in that gray area i would just stay stay away from it is what i would say because yeah. it's, it's it's not going to help your career and I think it's it's easy to discover kind of where that line is. You know, Movie Maker magazine does a does a, a issues on top fifty and 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 top coolest film festivals. I mean, there's ways to find these things from legitimate sources, and I would say, without a doubt, Nashville Film Festival is, is one that that if you haven't been here already, you know, now is the time because we we we'd love to help work with uh, all the filmmakers and screenwriters. We have a screenwriting competition as well, of course. So, yeah, and great, and great screenwriters uh, join this thing. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. One thing I will just add to that, Jason, your answer was awesome, but I'll add to that. If the first message you get from the festival is a discount code, that to me, I'm not saying that 100% of the time when that happens, it's a fraud. 
but that is a red flag. You should start paying very close attention there. If you're considering that festival, the very first message you get from them is I would love for you to submit your film and here's a 50% off code because yeah. real film festivals cannot afford to give you 50% off their submission fee. They just, they cannot afford it. Like the margins are too narrow. Um, if it's a legitimate sort of grant funded, uh, arts funded, uh, uh, sponsor funded festival. So, and just another, no, that's a, that's a great point. And it's absolutely true. And in fact, again, you know, we, we, we like to support filmmakers in every way we can. And we have a lot of people that whether they have hardships or whatever it may be, but the fact is, you know, we also as an organization, and as you know, from experience, you know, there are a lot of hard costs relative to presenting a, a festival that, we, that include theaters, licensing fees, screening fees, projectionists, uh, box office, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of expense. So that is really important, but we, we want the value of that entry to really um, be important as well. And so, but you're absolutely right. I, I think that's a great point. Boom. Biggest challenge of your career. You have to pick one would be one n- nipple gate, <laughs> fender, fender, oh, yeah. fender patent, I, fender patent issue. My- you find my quote. <laughs> That's what you can. This is multiple. Quotes. Yes, I was part or, of the Janet or or, or or co- yes, exactly. Or COVID festival. So you got COVID festival where you're thrown into the fire as a brand new executive director. The Fender patent uh, battle, which I'll just tell the audience was Fender was trying to patent three shapes, original shapes, certain mm-hmm. original shapes of guitars. And the nipple gate for those who might not know was when Justin Timberlake reveal Janet Jackson's nipple on live television during the Super Bowl halftime show. Okay. Which one most challenging of your career? Oh gosh, that's so easy. It was, it was the, the, the COVID 2020 by far was the biggest challenge. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. And if if you'd asked me that question without the multiple choice, I I probably wouldn't have said that because I I literally would have forgotten about how challenging (laughs) it was. I'm not kidding. I really put it, once I got over it, I was totally past it. I don't ever think of it. I'm, you know, onto the, onto the next year, but no, that's funny of those three things that you researched. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And actually there's a list of another hundred that you didn't find, but but, um, no, the, 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 in all seriousness, the COVID year, I mean, obviously everyone had challenges, but just to be very specific about a film festival, that journey for me was, you know, it happened in March, our festival, uh, meaning the the sort of cl- closing down of the of the world happened in March and our festival was in um, October at the time. And if you remember at the time, everyone in March was saying, oh, it, it'll be over by September. Like everyone was making these random predictions, having yeah, no yeah, idea yeah. what's really going to happen. And so from March until June, if you were to try to follow the news or or people you talked to or whatever from from March to June, nobody really had any idea what was going to be happening in the fall. So we had to continue to plan uh, an in-person festival. And of course, South by Southwest immediately folded their tent. I, I never had any intention of not having a festival and I was holding on as long as I could. And then there was a point, you know, pretty early on that I decided that I was going to parallel path the festival. So we were going to continue to uh, plan an in-person festival and it was going to be scalable because we knew the audience would be smaller no matter what, but we were, we, we were doing all the work as if we would have an in-person festival. And simultaneously, I was completely independently researching how to produce a, a virtual festival. And by that, I'm in my mind, it was not just putting selected films online. Cause to me, that was a, that was, that would be just a cop out. That wasn't enough. Yeah. Um, what I what we ended up doing is, and it was around Fourth of July. It, was, it just was clear that the, the in person festival was not going to happen. So we, we immediately changed course to this idea of a virtual festival. And the the one thing that we did that I didn't really see anyone else do that year was we presented our you know uh, I think then close to two hundred or so films online, curated in a in a really great interactive format online through our. Uh, uh, our, our streaming partner. And then we spent about a month doing in-person 
six feet apart directors chairs in studio uh, conversations with local filmmakers, local nonprofit leaders. We sat down with the head of TPAC, the head of the Nashville Opera, the head of the Nashville Humane Association. And we basically talked about what it means to uh, advocate arts here in Nashville. What challenges were they having? What were they looking forward to in 2021? What are their favorite movies? And then we, we, wow. we put that online as part of original content, including, like I said, local filmmaker interviews, so that there was an interactive aspect to the festival. There was the in-person Q&A. There were things that layered upon the movies themselves. So in my mind, we had a festival in 2020. It wasn't just a virtual festival. And it certainly wasn't just putting films online. Um, but I can't tell you how happy I was to, to know that the, for a lot of reasons that the world was coming out from undercover again, but, but I'm very proud of what we did in 2020, but that was six months of, as, as with everyone, never knowing, I mean, I didn't know if I was going to live. I mean, a lot of people didn't. And, you know, if, if, if producing a festival is, uh, is, is, you know, one of your problems, it's certainly not the number one, but from a career specific perspective, I would say. That was that was that was a big challenge, and there were a lot of people, both filmmakers and and people uh, locally, that were were dependent on what choices we made, and and so I'm, I'm very proud of how that all played out. Yeah, me too. It was great, and from an attendance standpoint, I'll tell you the most fire thing that happened in the was the was sort of the group chat in the virtual um, panels, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was so much networking going on. If, if I actually developed a personal rule out of that festival, and which was people will more readily network when they don't have to face the fear of meeting a person physically mm -hmm. than they will in person. So, it, so it's 10 times harder to network in person for most people than it is to do it online. So if you put a panel together online, and then and then encourage the chat. You will find names, phone numbers, business addresses. They will just they will everybody will just follow suit. They will they will be lambs jumping off the, the cliff, right? Um, there'll be pigs going for the corn feed, so to speak. And it's really great for filmmakers. It's really great for creatives. You end up with this giant Rolodex just because you held a thing online and it, if you believe in that, Jason, then it kind of merits considering doing some panels online just to um, test it. Now, on the other hand, maybe you never do it online because maybe the bar to be in this industry is to get over that fear because fear mm -hmm. is the mind killer. You have to go out there and actually go do it. And too bad. You're scared. OK, if they reject you, so what? Just go up there get the number, make the conversation, sharpen your communication skills. So just a, just a couple of thoughts. And by the way, you mentioned TPAC. I just want people to contextualize that. It's like, that's, that's like the Tennessee, um, Tennessee's performing. biggest sort of perform, yeah, performing yes, arts performing. center. It's like mm -hmm. for, where you would go watch a play uh, yeah. just for, for people. And you mentioned South by Southwest. I should give a shout out to two time guest in front of the podcast, Corby Linker, you prolific musician and artist and, and, filmmaker and son right uh had had sort of a i thought an insightful take on south by, by southwest um he was there this last week and he has a newsletter and he he just mentioned that it's become like this technocratic uh corporate sponsorship doo-doo that it, it and it used to be for musicians and weirdos which you know if you're an artist you like that version of south by south southwest more than the tech bro version and it's a cautionary tale i think to other festivals, you need to have that influx of cash from those sponsors. But if you do too much of it, you just lose the festival in a mm -hmm. way, or it becomes something else. And I think what he's lamenting is it's really not a festival for independent musicians anymore. It's something bigger and totally, you know, different from that. Um, next rapid fire question or pseudo yeah. rapid fire <laughs> question. Um, if you could be introduced to one person in film, who would it be and what makes him special? One person in film. Uh, boy, I mean, you know, honestly, I don't know that there is one person. I feel like, um, and even if I were introduced to him, I, I, I don't know 
what I would get out of it. I will tell you a quick, a quick story. Um, Please. George Lucas, who I, I met uh, years ago and the, the, he was really releasing one of the, one of the star Wars sequels. I don't remember what year it was, but it was at the, uh, the trade show in Vegas for the distributors, what used to be called, uh, it's Cin- cinema con. Now I think it used mm-hmm. to be called show West. Yeah. And the, the, the story is as part of the big release, they're, they're, they're previewing the film. They show a trailer and I was at the back of the room and imagine 800 chairs set up kind of auditorium style in a, a aisle down the middle. I was standing at the very back of the room at the back of the aisle in, in the dark, just watching the trailer. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the trailer from both wings of the stage, something like 120 stormtroopers came up on stage. And then from behind the curtain comes Darth Vader and the voice of James Earl Jones booming over the yeah. auditorium. And I'm standing at the back of the room watching this thing in awe. Cause you know, my, six-year-old self was just like, I can't believe that Darth Vader and the stormtroopers are here, right? Yeah, exactly. And so as soon as Darth finishes his speech, he walks off the front of the stage, not the side or the back, and one-to-one in line, each of those stormtroopers comes behind him in a direct line, and they walk right down that center aisle, and I'm standing right at the end of it. And Darth Vader is walking, his capes flowing, and I'm not kidding. My knees started to weaken and buck. <laughs> and, and he's walking full speed. And as he got close to me, he tilted his helmet like this and then kept walking and <laughs> was right by me. And I almost fainted. And I was like, I, I, and then all the stormtroopers went by. And so the next day I was in a press room with George Lucas. And I said, that was quite a presentation yesterday. I mean, my God. And he's like, oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and I go, I got to tell you, I about died when Darth Vader walked past me. I, I literally almost died. And to, to my great relief, he laughed. He laughed genuinely. He was really thrilled that he almost, you know, killed a 30 something year old man at the time, whatever it was. So, uh, but I still, when I even talk about that, it was, it was one of the most kind of shocking, shocking things of my life, believe it or not. I mean, it's amazing how it's just powerful, you know, film, oh, yeah. film, film will always be because it's there's just no more powerful medium to get a message across. It's, uh, it's you know, I always talk about the marketing rule of of I, maybe I should give it a name because I always just over describe it, but it's like the rules, uh, the order of magnitude rule of of marketing. Meaning, text is level one. If you want to order of magnitude higher engagement, you add text and audio, or you create text and audio. And if you want to order of magnitude higher engagement, you go text, audio, video, and that's what movies are but movies are even more than that because they give you text audio video story uh and sound and score so it, it's even it's this hyper engaging thing and it's enough to make a grown man get weak in the knees when darth Vader walks by so that, that oh, yeah. is, i appreciate that it's an amazing story um well, if, what, I liked, what I liked about his reaction too was that I mean he you couldn't just imagine all of the feedback he's gotten about oh. you know being the Star Wars guy and the fact is I he he really s- seemed to genuinely still derive joy from the fact that he had created that power that he that, that it has over people yeah, and man. so you know he has he the had, force. yeah he hadn't become callous by it and so I mean you know when it what interests me about any filmmaker is is honestly whatever their 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 project is and the and and how they got there and then the power that they get from it so whether it's Spielberg or Lucas or or the next person at the Nashville Film Festival I find all of those exchanges you know equally interesting honestly I mean that one obviously is a more re- relatable because of of who he is but um, I just love the the artistic journey that that all of these people go on and and so so appreciate how much goes into it yeah likewise uh, for sure and I appreciate you saying that we've had Dicey Wildman, Brian Owens, Todd Luby, Leslie Raymond, Miriam Bell. We've had all these people on to talk about what it means to run a film festival and ask them this question. So I want to add you to the Pantheon and, and ask you the same question. If somebody wanted to be an executive director of a film festival, a Strata film festival, and they had one month to just get themselves ready to go, what are the first three things you would teach them in that month? 
Um, one month. Wow. Well, first of all, you need at least 12 to 14 months. So I would say let's throw what, out, let's throw out the month. What are the first three things you would teach them? Are, 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 are give um, them? Yeah. Well, I, number one, I honestly, for running a film festival, you have to be prepared for anything and everything. And that includes a global pandemic that includes, you know, venue change that includes anything. And, and I think all of those folks you mentioned have probably had to deal with more than a few in their time. So for me, it's about imagining the festival that you want in its perfect form, preparing for everything and then preparing for for everything that you can imagine and preparing for everything that you can't imagine. Uh, so, and that's kind of, that's just a lot of, of, of work and, and thought and planning that goes into that. And the second would be, which I've learned in this organization and, and it's true of any organization, the, the difference, the big difference between a film festival and a corporate organization that I've been a, a lot more familiar with is you know, a lot of these nonprofit festivals at, at different scales, they rely very heavily on a seasonal uh, employee base. So that what that means is you don't have 50 employees year round that are doing a job year round. What you end up is you, you end up recruiting and hiring for 40 some people um, for the course of a very short period of time. Sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's it's three weeks. And what I would say is that's the, the number one key to what I think. I feel is the growing success of this organization, the continued growth of this organization is we have worked really hard to not only identify, but help grow and mentor some really excellent people, most of whom already have either other jobs or other part-time jobs, other full-time jobs, other their students, whatever they may be, but they believe in what we're doing and they come in and they may be a box office manager or a theater floor manager or a V, uh, 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 event planner, whatever it may be. And those are the people that at the end of last year and even the year before that, I look back and said, boy, we really did that right because mm -hmm. that's your make or break thing as, a, as a, a festival runner is you're so dependent on so many other people uh, that in, in what is such a compressed timeline of whether you're a 10 day festival or seven day festival, everything that those people are doing on your behalf is super important to the experience of the filmmaker and the audience member. And, and, and if those things fall apart, you don't have your credibility, you don't have your brand equity and, and, and that's all you have, right? Yeah. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta take care of those. So it's, it's make sure you, you, you surround yourself with and, and, and coach up really good people. And the third one I would say is, you know, if you do those f first two things really, really well, um, just make sure that you enjoy the experience and enjoy the moment and have some fun. Because if as executive director or as a programming director, if, if you're not enjoying yourself or trying to enjoy yourself amidst all the stress and pressure that you may be carrying, then no one else below you, around you or next to you is going to have a great time. So you need to genuinely and, and I had to learn this. I learned this earlier before coming to the festival, but as, as a as a corporate person, you know, you really have to in, embrace the moment and enjoy what you're doing, because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, those around you won't enjoy what they're doing. And, and that's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes it's it's easy to worry about the yes. thing that you, you're responsible for. It's sometimes the hardest thing to do is to have fun. And and so yes. I would say those, those three things together. Now, one of those doesn't work without the other. But if you put all three of those things together, you might have you might have a good chance. Well, two and three, man, Jason, those, those hit me right in the, right in the fills right there, because I can relate to that. So, so closely. Um, yeah. One thing I talked to my team about is that all we have is our brand and, and our social credibility. And so when you put out bad artwork, when you have a really terrible take that just is so wrong or doesn't align or, or, you know, in, in my space, you know, where you're speaking to creatives and you say something that makes it seem like you've never made anything in your life. Um, those kind of things have huge uh, impacts and you never get those people back because they always question your authenticity or, or your ability. I always say we have an extra burden because our company has the word creative in it. Like mm -hmm. you can't just put out ordinary because we just told you we were creative, right? Um, we, we had this uh, short run earlier this year, Jason, where it was like, don't have bad sound. And the clip had bad sound. 
<laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? But fast forward to point three, I spent all of last year miserable and I made everyone around me miserable every single day. And I found myself getting into fights with everybody in the company, outside the company, maybe everybody, but you like just, <laughs> just, just, just angry because I, because I wasn't, um, doing, uh, as well as I wanted to do. I wasn't doing as much as I wanted to do. And it wasn't happening the way I envisioned it. And I came into this year saying, you know what? I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to love doing this. I'm going to take the failures. Um, see, cause I grew up real modest. I have a big chip on my shoulder. So that's what motivates me. gets me up in the morning, the deal making, the, the entrepreneurship, all that comes from a place of not having a lot or being told even more importantly, being told I wasn't going to be a lot or be anything. People in my own family saying, Oh, you're going to be dead by what? 22, 23. Oh, you're just like your uncle Bobby. You're going to be in jail. Like these are things I was told on a regular basis by family members, the people who love me the most. So mm -hmm. I have this thing of overcoming, right? And in that you can be a real bastard. You can be mm -hmm. a mean guy. And I'm like, nope, got to love it. I got to love the people around me. I got to take whatever I think their shortcoming is and make it a strength. I got to take my shortcomings and not give myself such a hard time. And because if you don't love it, uh, it, even the wins feel bad. Even the wins don't, don't feel satisfying. So I really appreciate that answer. This next and last, you know, uh, um, shotgun question here, um, rapid round or pseudo rapid, rapid round question is kind of akin to that, which is you've had this long career in communications, marketing, uh, music and film, and just touching all these different places and people. And we have a moniker here where we say filmmakers are people too. And so I'm just curious when you got into a dark place, like I described in 2023 that I was in, how did you get out of it? Or is there any tool you could share with this audience who hears knows on a daily basis from financiers to programs, et cetera? What is a tool that you've used to get yourself out of a dark place when you've had it in your career? Wow. You know, that that's, that's also, I mean, a great and thoughtful question. And, you know, I, it, I have the, I don't know if it's a if it's a, a burden or or a benefit of of being really optimistic about my own life, my own future, and 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 I and the the downside of it is I always imagine things are better than they really are, mm -hmm. and and the positive side of that is I always can imagine how they can be better than they really are, and so. Uh, but but I have to always be self aware of that because I sometimes make assumptions that are 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 false and and I have to correct them. But when I when I found myself kind of in those places and they happen in any person's life for any number of reasons. I mean the things that I have to just the two things I do is remind myself that you know it's just it's just a moment in time and and it it won't be like this for forever, and, that, and that's that's only. It's only it gets you so far because it's just kind of self-talk and it doesn't really solve your problem. But at least yeah. it, it gives you a little bit of, of, of steam to get through that day. Um, and uh, the, the second thing is to just do something totally different. And what, what I mean by that is um, just go do something that you wouldn't normally do to make yourself feel better. Whatever your coping mechanism is, don't rely on that. Go do something totally, totally different. And that can be anything. Um, I mean, nothing dangerous, of course, or, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, just like, I don't know if you like going to movies to make yourself feel better, don't go to a movie to make yourself feel better. Go do something, go ride a bike or whatever. I mean, you can, you go start a garden in your backyard or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, go, it could be anything. Um, and, and so I, I try to find those, things that aren't so familiar because to get out of a bad place, you have to go into unfamiliar territory. And those can be really simple distractions that, that all of a sudden you find yourself like I do is working on something that's totally unimportant, totally unrelated, but it, it's, a, it becomes important. 
right? Mm -hmm. I, and I'll give you a really early, early example of this that I think maybe where I learned this lesson. Um, very early in my career, and I can't, it was in kind of a, a, a crazy, like a very stressful time and a young kind of aspiring executive. And I, I, I was in a, like a, a hobby store and I saw those, remember those old, um, uh, the cars that you could build and paint, you know, they're like replica yeah, model cars. I did that all the time. I love model cars. You know how hard those are. You know how yeah. hard those are to do, right? Yeah. So I yeah. got one, I got one several. and, 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 you know, you, you put out your little workstation, you got your glue, you're filing all this stuff. And before you know it, you're in that thing. Your head is in that thing and nothing else in the ma in the world matters. And what a great way to escape whatever is plaguing you. Because for probably a week of that time of my life, every night after work, I would just work on a little bit more, a little bit more. And it became really important. And when I was done, I was so happy. I, was, I forgot. Yeah. I forgot. All my other pro I mean, that sounds silly, but that's just one example of, of, of a hundred that you could, you could do to get out of, out of a place. Um, and I would just say on top of that, I mean, the thing I've tried to learn and you, you kind of mentioned it in your dark place. It's like, don't take it out on others, no matter what it is, because, it just never, it just never serves. It just doesn't serve anything. You got to take it as your own yes. and you got to deal with it on your own. And, and you're not always going to be your best self, but um, you know, by, by, by spraying your misery around to others, it, it, it only compounds it. It doesn't, it doesn't decrease it. Yes, exactly. I, that, that is so well, well put. And I hope they still make model cars, by the way. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, that was the only one I, that's the only one I ever did. It was I, great. <laughs> I, I loved them. I did them all the time. And I had a friend uh, that lived on the street from me named, named Robbie Sweeney, who, who's now no longer with us. But he, he got me into it because his, his father would build cars from the ground up in real life. And it was so important to get every detail right. Like, like the paint would have to be perfect and mm -hmm. every piece has to be, and, and we would scrutinize how well we really did it. And I, so I wasn't a Lego guy, like my, my business partner and, and co-host this podcast, Nick, he loves Legos and he's a great Lego builder. Like he's a master builder at it. But my thing was the detail and the fine thing that the, of the model car, the, the stuff you, you can't see, like how, how meticulous were you on the part that's under the car? And so I'm so yeah. glad you reminded me. I might go buy one of those tonight. Damn it. Yeah. I might just have to go buy me a Corvette model car tonight or a 69 Corvette or something like that. Yeah. Just put one together. Oh. I appreciate that. Um, uh, huge points. And, and I hope the filmmakers take heed to it. Jason, you've been incredible with your time. These uh, This conversation was as fun as I thought it was going to be. I have one or two uh, more questions. And then we're just going to wrap this thing up. Um, just to end us out here, you could do this. You totally could. And I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about it, but would you ever run for office? <laughs> uh, no. Is that in Is the plans? It, no, it's not. And actually it's a, it's a great question. I, I actually studied political science in college. I have a minor in political science, to really thoroughly enjoyed it. But when it came to the practical app. I love the philosophy of political science and in, in, including all of it, including law and, and, and all that goes with that. But when it came to the practical application of how the, the political system in this country works and from a campaign level, grassroots level, I, I realized that they're not my people. I don't have an appetite <laughs> for it. And, and, and unless someone just preemptively wanted to elect me, I, I, I don't have uh, the appetite to, to run for um, uh, anything. Uh, one quick uh, a side note to that, though, which is interesting. Again, in my very probably first five years of my career, I was invited on a, on a, a corporate retreat from the parent company that I worked for at the time. And one of their guest speakers was a then retired senator from uh, Michigan. And so I was among 60 guests from this corporation that were invited to this uh, three day thing in uh, somewhere in, in Florida, Key West, I guess it was. And um, anyway, after a couple of dinners, this guy says the same thing you just said. And he's like, you know, I, I think you might be good at this. And he actually came back to L.A. Uh, months later and uh, tried to convince me to, to run for a U.S. Um, House of Representatives seat in Orange County. 
and mm-hmm. was was giving me the roadmap to do that. And and, and I was just like, I, I think I'm going to stay in the entertainment business. I mean, I thought about it, but I I, I realized no. And and the older I've gotten, and the more I've seen, the 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 more grateful I am that I did not make that choice. I would love to make a difference. Don't get me wrong, but the 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 way that that machine works uh is 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 not something that i have great love for i agree with you in the sense that so i was a district campaign leader district 31 for the ron paul 2008 campaign and those were incredible times so i I won't say that they weren't awesome like i really enjoyed doing it and i was good at it but i've also never met especially at the caucuses and especially the way the media covers certain candidates differently. I have, and I'm a journalism major. I have never met more transparently corrupt people Mm -hmm. (laughs) than, than trying to get a sort of independent minded sort of outsider candidate, more press, more attention. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. And when yeah. people have said to me, oh, you should, you'd be a good politician. They say it like that. You'd be a good politician. I'm always talking, it's like always an insult. So oh, yeah. that'll tell you, that'll tell you everything you need to know about that is like, okay, they're <laughs> yes. not complimenting me here. They're saying that, uh, I'm a silver tongue devil is what they're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah. I've tried to like use that to my advantage when I can, but, but not be lumped in with that. Uh, so s- same here. Um, Jason, this has been great. Uh, any last thoughts on the festival for, I know it, it begins on the 25th of September this year, 2024. It's the 19th. Of or it's the 19th. September. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 19th. Yes, you're right. 19th. Of course you are. 55th annual Nashville Film Festival, September 19th through the 25th, 2024. Pre-screening and script reading are officially open. How yep. are things going so far and what can this audience and all the attendees expect from the festival in the coming year that you can share yeah. right now. Sure. Yeah, no, everything is in great shape. I'm really excited about where we are on on the kind of the the, the pace right now. Everything's going very well. I think it's going to honestly be our, our best festival, uh, that, certainly that I've been a part of maybe ever. And then um, the couple things to remind folks, filmmakers, um, those deadlines, those final deadlines for um, uh, screenplay are, are slightly earlier than film, but the film de- deadlines are somewhere mid June. So if you haven't gotten your, your film or screenplay and, you know, make sure and, and check out our website and get, get them in film freeway. And for screenplay, you can also submit via cover, cover fly this year. Um, the, the thing for an audience member cool. locally, I would say, you know, it, it, whether you you want to plan a trip around the Nashville film festival or you live here, the thing I, I just constantly need to remind people is that, you know, you can be a part of the Nashville Film Festival in small, medium, large, extra large, whatever size you, that you want. And what that means is you can come and buy one ticket to one film and you're, you've are you been a part of the festival. I think the idea of going to a film festival, people sometimes get a little intimidated by what a great undertaking that might be. It's not like, you know, going to Bonnaroo and sleeping yeah. in the woods for, you know, three, three nights or whatever. I mean, it's just, you can come and see a movie a day. You can see five movies a day. You can see one movie during the whole week. You can come to our opening night party. It's really based on your own, um, your, your own availability and, and level of interest. But what I would say is make yourself a part of the Nashville film festival, uh, in some way this year and, and help, help us build it and grow it and be a part of it because it only works when it's really, you know, a, a bunch of, of, of voices that, again, are f- creative filmmakers, music makers and audience members all together in one place, whether that's in the format of a Q&A after a film or that's an opening night party or that's a mid festival mixer. I mean, that's what makes film festivals special. The, the films are really important. But what makes film festivals special is the ability to meet, network, talk to people, talk to people yeah. about what they created, what they just saw, getting audience reactions. I mean, there's just nothing like it. And so if you know nothing about film festivals, the best way to learn about it is just to show up and show up to one film one day. And I guarantee you, you'll want to come back to more. Yeah, I agree. And maybe we can do a thing where this podcast can live stream to YouTube just like some of the happenings, one of the main sort of locations of the festival. 
uh, guests can stop by, be interviewed, meet me, meet, meet the team. Um, just a variety, like endless ideas could come out of that on how to, to take that person that's on the fence and is actually able to come and then show them something, say something, interview the right person, filmmaker, et cetera, uh, do maybe festival organization drop-ins, et cetera, where they can see it in real time because it's being streamed live uh, from a location and then say, you know what? I'm going down there. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm going to buy a ticket. Let's go. Let's do it. And so it absolutely. Yeah. So just a so just a thought there. Uh, tell everybody, though, that that wants to plan ahead where they can buy tickets, where they can uh, find you on the Internet, find the festival Internet uh, and on social yeah. media. Yeah, the, the best the best one stop shopping source is Nashville Film Festival dot org within there. We're going to we'll, we'll continue to build out our pages around the festival. We really haven't announced anything about the festival yet other than the dates. Um, we will be beginning to do that probably in the next month. So we'll, we'll start rolling out our venues and some of the, uh, you know, more specifics around some of the mixers and parties and so forth. So I would say stay tuned to uh, Na NashvilleFilmFestival.org. Uh, and, and even more instantly, if you sign up for our newsletter there, you'll get that in your inbox the minute that we announce it. Our social medias are all the Nash Film Fest. So through all the major platforms, Nash Film Fest on social to follow there, what we also announced through there. For me personally, anyone that wants to get to me on, uh, you know, through LinkedIn and or uh, my email is jason at nashfilm.org if anyone wants to reach me directly. And similarly, like I said, at the festival itself, I love just hearing from people about their experience. And, and if, if you happen to be at the festival and see me, don't be afraid to come up and say hello. I promise I won't be uh, annoyed by being even interrupted. I really enjoy just hearing from people and, and meeting people. And one of my uh, one of the things I get most disappointed about is if people were at the festival and they didn't come and say hello and they tell me that later, it's like, well, I would have loved to have met you. So so please, please be sure and do that if you, if you see me. And uh, we'd just love to get as many people out as we can. Here, here, you guys heard it from the horse's mouth, NashvilleFilmFestival.org to submit um, your work. You'll get all the details there, uh, certainly to look at the dates and find out uh, when the festival's happening and all the different events. And you can reach out to Jason at Jason at Nashfilm.org. Is that right? Nashfilm.org. Yep. 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 And so sure. do, do hit him up. Uh, if you love this podcast and want to find out more, you can find us at the make it podcast.com. That's the make it podcast.com. You can find out everything you need to know about this podcast, including where to listen and watch it, which is pretty much everywhere. Apple, Spotify. You can follow us on our YouTube channel. You can watch full episodes now on X, which is formerly Twitter. You can watch full episodes on Facebook and me and producer Papa Bear, producer Joe and the team, we're going to figure out if we can upload full episodes to LinkedIn and Pinterest very soon. So those are a couple of things coming on the horizon there. We also have a wonderful newsletter called Indie Insights. It comes out every two weeks and it's everything from around the world of film that you didn't see. It's the esoteric, it's tools, it's insider information, it's even discount codes to this very festival we've been talking about when the time comes. So do subscribe. It's free. It's at bonsai.film forward slash subscribe. Again, so www.bonsai.film forward slash subscribe. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can do that on X at flame in your heart, or you can just search for Chris Barkley and I will come right up. Nick isn't on this podcast, but he has an awesome Reddit and you can find him and ask him film questions at Nicholas Bugs on Reddit or just email him directly at nick at bonsai.film. Last but not least, please do let us know how you're liking our uh, partnership with Bodega Sync and uh, all the independent artists that we have rolling through on every episode. So if you like the music that you're about to hear here in a moment, if you're on the audio uh, portion of the podcast only, uh, do find those artists, do support them, do download, do stream. We talked about how little you get per stream. And uh, so every extra stream really does mean something and count uh, when you have to have such a large number to even make a living. More importantly, go see them live and, so, and, and sort of support them on their micro tours or, or even larger tours across the nation. And shout out to uh, Randall Foster and, and, and John over at Bodega. 
uh, for, for making this happen. And so with that, uh, there is no uh, credo because uh, Nick isn't on here, but I can I can certainly say it. That's be better, be creative, be engaged. Jason, I will talk to you soon. And this has been a blast, man. I appreciate you. Yes, thank you, Chris. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and good luck. I can't wait to see you again soon. Yeah, real soon. And uh, round two, if you want to talk about anything. So <laughs> round, round two on me. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> All right, brother. All right. Be good. Thank Peace. You. Thanks, guys.